Yeah, what does it take to do heart, to have a quorum at heart? Um, and we have Tom Yamachika talking tax with Tom this morning. Uh, welcome to the show, Tom. Morning, glad to be on. So you, you talked about, uh, just a moment ago, you talked about some hot news with Brian Black. Let's talk about that first, because we're interested in whatever happens on Gut Replace. Sure. Um, as you uh, probably remember, for a long, you know, long, long time ago, uh, Common Cause Hawaii and uh, the Civil Beat uh, 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 Civil Center Beat for the Public Interest and um, uh, what's the other organization? I, f I forget, but um, uh, they challenged one of the enactments of the legislature in, I think it was 2018. Uh, it started off as a uh, uh, a bill regarding water safety and turned into one in, in re regarding recidivism, or some, or the other way around. Uh, and uh, the uh, the argument was that the bill was invalid uh, because the 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 version that ultimately got signed into law uh, didn't receive three readings in one house. And uh, the legislature said, oh, poppycock. Um, yeah, the, the same bill with the same title received three readings in both houses and, and it received a final reading. <laughs> and what's your problem? Uh, the problem is that we're different bills <laughs> in substance. And uh, that is uh, uh, something that the Supreme Court of Hawaii held earlier today. Uh, they, they held... Uh, in a three to two decision uh, that uh, Civil Beat and uh, a Common Cause and the League of Women Voters were right. And uh, they, uh, they struck down the law. Uh, they made it perspective only. So it only applies to that case and subsequent enactments, but it's now a very, um, it's now a very tangible limitation on the legislature's power to do cut uh, to 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 do gutting and replacing. It, it needs to have at least some germaneness uh, to the bill as introduced before they can, you know, uh, keep counting and and don't have to reset the count of of hearings. Yeah, what what um, uh, where does that phrase come from? Some germaneness is that yours or is that the Supreme Court's? It's in the it's in the court opinion. Interesting, because there, you know, there's a gradient here. Suppose um, they change the bill by a hundred percent. We know the answer, and if it's zero, we know the answer. But what if it's twenty-five or fifty percent or seventy-five percent? We don't know the whether it's some germaneness, um, and that may have to be decided later. Huh? That that's true. Although the court did say. Uh, that there is a very, very heavy burden on the person challenging the bill. Uh, it needs to be proven unconstitutional beyond, the, you know, beyond a reasonable doubt. So that's it's very tough. Um, so you so you need to have a hundred percent or close to it in order to prevail. I think beyond a reasonable doubt was that the opinion also? Because that was in the, the that was that was in criminal conviction. Yeah, <laughs> it's also uh, the standard for challenging the constitutionality of a. Uh, of so. a law, yeah. and that was not only not only in this opinion, but also some some earlier ones. So, so that's... what did the minority of two say? What was their rationale for wanting to, um, you know, uh, leave things in place? Um, uh, they basically said, "Look, you know, when the Constitutional Convention was considering uh, amendments to the legislative process, you know, they brought all this stuff up, and they and they left." Uh, you know, the procedure's intact. So, um, you know, people at the time uh, were, you know, were, were giving the legislator flexibility uh, to conduct themselves, uh, you know, in accordance with the constitution, but uh, with a lot of flexibility because they are a co-equal branch of government. And- well, That's uh, a pretty weak argument, uh, just on the basis of just logic, but also, <laughs> You know, transparency is um, is in vogue now, 
And uh, transparency requires that if um, somebody is going to do a gut and replace, uh, they let the public have a whack at the bill um, with hearings. And uh, it seems yeah, a lot to of times that, they don't. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I think a lot of that's by design. Course, they don't in the ordinary course, even with the tell me what you mean. And, um, no, I mean, uh, I, I think some legislators uh, keep that tactic, uh, you know, in their back pocket so that if they have a, a bill that's fairly controversial uh, and they, you know, don't want to uh, provoke public reaction, uh, they wait until the last possible second, uh, gut and replace it in the, you know, in the final version where there's no more public hearings and, and just carry out uh, negotiations with the other house. Uh, or, or with their committee members, and you know, you know, amidst a cloud of secrecy. Mm. No, that's not transparent at all. And uh, I, I, the, the public has never liked. I have never liked it. I'm sure you have never liked gut and replace, and it has suffered uh, increasing criticism over the years. So this decision is, would be a popular decision, and and the the two justices who voted against it, uh, that would not be popular. Well, um, we at the foundation have been, uh, you know, following, you know, Common Cause's um, a Rusty Scalpel Award, which is given by, by them and the League of Women Voters to uh, the bill that least resembles the, uh, the form in which it was introduced. Uh, and, and we note that I think in, uh, in the five or six years the, uh, the award's been given, uh, Tax bills won five times. That's a lot. Yeah. In percentage terms. Yeah. Well, okay. Thank you for that report on that subject. Um, it's very interesting and it's a step forward for transparency and for good government. And uh, thank, thanks to the Supreme Court for ruling that way. And hopefully this will minimize gut and replace going forward, although uh, it's still a question of degree. Yes. Um, let's move on to our main topic today, and that's uh, the uh, uh, Rapid Transit Board, HART, um, and uh, what, the, what their quorum problems are. A very interesting subject. Can you, can you give us a handle on what has happened there and what the current um, state of affairs is? Sure. <laughs> um, basically, when, when HART was formed, it was, it was formed by a, uh, a, a city charter Amendment, of course, which requires a uh, a popular vote at the in, at the general election, and at that point, you know, when when Hart was originally formed, uh, it was formed with a nine. Uh, I'm sorry, a ten person board. Okay, um, one of whom was ex officio, so that person didn't vote. Uh, and in do in in forming Hart, they cross referenced a section. Uh, another section of the charter, uh, you know, which which refers to boards and commissions generally, and it says uh, you need a majority uh, of the entire membership to vote in the affirmative for anything to pass, and you also need a uh, a, a majority of the entire membership to have a quorum. Okay, so with the that's, ten person that's board, common. that's common, right? You and that's that. not that common. Okay, because it's it's actually kind of strict, because uh, with that kind of wording, if somebody doesn't show up or abstains, it's the same as a no. So, uh, uh, so for hard to have anything to to get anything done, out of the nine voting members, they need six to vote yes. And they need you know, six I, just people to there, better I wouldn't I wouldn't be bothered by that because the the amount of money is um, you know the biggest project ever undertaken in the state. Oh, that's that's when it was formed. Now, in two thousand seventeen. Right, but you agree something with happened that that they did it intentionally because of the amount of money that would be involved. Billions, we don't know how much. You know, but because there was so much money, it's not unreasonable to have that kind of strictness in the voting re requirements. Huh? Oh, no, but here's the wrinkle. In 2017, because the state was concerned 
of bailing out Hart and making sure the state funds, which again amounted to hundreds of millions, if not billions of dollars, were being put to good use, they uh, inserted a provision in the bailout law, which is you know uh, Act One of Special Session 2017 that says the Speaker of the House and the, and the President of the Senate will each appoint two Hart board members non-voting. Okay, so Hart gets four more members, and now they have a total body count of fourteen, which means. Um, that you need eight affirmative votes to accomplish anything, and you need eight, eight members to have a quorum. Now, uh, eight affirmative votes means if two people don't show up, there's no action that can be, that, that can be taken. The same, is, the same rule as before. Except now the magic number is eight, not six. Yeah, okay. So, um, and, and, and a couple of the members, uh, the voting members now, uh, were heads of city departments. Uh, and, uh, you know, they're busy people. So they can't show up all the time. Uh, and of course, they can't, they can't delegate the votes either. So, uh, so what happens? Um, there's, there was actually testimony put in uh, you know, last legislative session by, you know, one of the voting members that said, look, we can't do anything. Um, uh, a, a, a requirement of eight affirmative votes out of, out of nine voting members is just too much. We can't do anything. And that, and that basically you caused get the nine voting members. No. Um, remember, uh, when Hart was formed, it had nine voting members out of 10. Uh. Okay, so there was there was a ten member board, nine voting, one not. Yeah. And now it has fourteen. Now it has fourteen because the state added four more non voting. So oh, the four are non voting. That's the a four are piece. all non voting. Yes, they're actually more like state observers. You know, to give input to, you know, to watch the uh, you know watch the store. Um, on behalf of the, you know, the, the state and the legislature. It was a mistake to do that. Well, they didn't, they didn't know that. Um, they, they, they didn't know uh, that uh, they would have a, a problem with, you know, moving the bar up to eight voting members to get anything done. I think that was an unintended consequence. But that's what happened. Okay. And 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 so now let's 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 bring this up to today. Um uh, during uh I think the June July time frame. Hoyt Zia uh who is I think still a voting member but at that time was interim chair. Uh, he he got some um you know new intelligence from Corp Council. And, and and the new intelligence basically said, look, there's a, a Hawaii constitution provision uh, that says uh, that the state um, cannot screw with the organization uh, of uh, a, you know a city governmental departments agencies or 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 um, other organizational units. And and this city corp council uh, opined uh, that it was okay uh, to not treat these four state appointees as members of the board because uh, the charter provisions have priority uh, over the state law under under that section of the constitution. This sounds logical. And so, and so he said, uh, "Your voting, uh, your your voting requirements now down to six. And that's what and that's what Hoyt said. Okay, from um, even though uh, there was a contrary opinion before, now we're now we're doing six. 
Of course, this prompted some internal dissension, uh, but, but it was six. And now, uh, Kurt Favela, who is the uh, one Republican senator uh, in our Hawaii State Senate, acting as an individual, he sued Hart, saying, you're not acting legally. You need to go back to eight. Um, why would he go to that trouble? And we, we, obviously, it was going to stand as an obstacle to action by that board. Well, I mean, uh, he, th for whatever reason, thinks the legislature's will has been is being thwarted. Um, I mean, when when uh, uh, the Corp Council opinion came out, for example, uh, Scott Psyche, uh, the Speaker of the House, basically said, "Well, pff, you know, if they don't want the legislature input, then you know, give us back our money." <laughs> That didn't go anywhere, did it? <laughs> <laughs> but but it's it's now a real problem because uh, you know can Hart make decisions? It's got to make decisions in order to function. And can those decisions be challenged in the future if they're made by six? Right. That's uh, that. Then that's basically the you know the the question that that uh, Senator Fell is now bringing before the before the circuit court. Sounds like this has to go to the Supreme Court for a reliable determination <clears throat> because the risks are so great on either side, and we have to have um, a statement of law on the point, don't we? Uh, I would think so. I mean, I think it's in everybody's interest to. Uh, to have some definitiveness in in what's going on, and uh, and by the way, um, Senator Favela sued under uh, the Sunshine Law, Chapter ninety two, and anybody can sue under Chapter ninety two. You don't have to have standing. You just you just need to have, um, you know, some kind of defect in the procedure of a of a, you know, a border commission uh, constituted under state or county law. Well, my reaction is, um, gee, what, what, what is he thinking? Why would he do this? It's, um, it's destructive. And it could be based on, I don't know what he has said publicly about it, but um, it could be based on uh, a, a general opposition to rail. Because- uh, Well, to that require... could be too, but, but I, I would rather um, the uh, controversy be resolved sooner than later. Mm -hmm. I, 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 would, I would much rather, um, you know, there'd be some determination now than, you know, uh, you know, five, 10, whenever years in the future, when the, when the rail's built, and then somebody says, well, the whole thing's invalid. Oh, absolutely. On the other hand, if requiring that the high quorum um, is going to stop them from taking any affirmative action, if there's anybody who's not available or who votes against them, um, they won't be able to do anything. So, you know, if you didn't want rail, you would A, uh, create a barrier to, to vote taking and, and at the same time, uh, create a cloud over any, um, any vote that would take with less than the eight requirement that, that Favela seeks. Um, so it really throws it into a cocked hat. And so um, another major substantive existential problem for rail no. Yeah, and I and I, uh, I like you uh, think this uh, is a problem for uh, all of the taxpayers um, because this this sucker costs so much, uh, especially in Honolulu, and uh, it's got to be resolved quickly. I think. Well, you know, maybe uh, maybe there's some procedure, Tom. I wouldn't know offhand, but. Um, there was some procedure to get to the Supreme Court right away, uh, even with some kind of provisional remedy um, to have them uh, opine on this sooner than later. Because right now you have, a, you have a, a project in which billions have already been spent 
billions more need to be spent, however you like or dislike rail, um, and you have, um, you know, the, the, the disruption to our, to Honolulu in general, be, because of the construction, gee, what a mess it makes. If you wanted to make a mess out of rail, this is what you would do. So right, it, but, should, but at it least... should get to the Supreme Court soon. Even if the it's a provisional remedy kind of a emergency, you know, ruling. Well, the the the, the circuit courts can, uh, you know, can do injunctions. Um, they can, you know, render declaratory judgments, and and those uh, typically get re get get reviewed uh, on appeal. Um, there's also the possibility that the legislature can fix this. Okay, there the was legislature actually messed it up in the first place. How can the legislature fix it? Um, there was actually a bill or a couple of bills in this past session uh, that uh, were uh, at least in name uh, fixes to this situation. What kind of logical fixes? Uh, that they would have amended the 2017 session law to permit. Um, uh, or, or to to say that the uh, the state appointed members were not members for purposes of quorum or uh, voting requirements. Yeah, so it's nomenclature, but yeah, something like that, where they they're really only observers, uh, since they really are only observers. Yeah, no, I, I think that's right, and I think um, you know one way that the court can get out of this. Uh, is is to say, you know, um, look, we recognize that the legislature has, you know, the right to put observers on the heart board um, because this is fiscal policy and they do have, you know, rights on fiscal policy to uh, make sure the counties are in their proper sphere. Um, but I, I, I think I'm, you know, I agree with you that the uh, the side effect of calling them quote unquote members and thereby raising the uh, requirement for quorum and voting to eight was an unintended consequence. There's nothing uh, about that in the legislative legislative history. Um, and uh, I don't think the, uh, you know, the, the, the people in the legislature knew that this was going to be in effect. Well, let me, let me line up the options that, that have come out in this discussion and otherwise, and see which ones are most appealing. We need a solution. Okay? Um, going through the ordinary court system is not a good solution. It will simply take too long. Um, it does require injunctive relief, provisional relief of some kind and a special appeal to the Supreme Court. Uh, that that is um, that's a maybe that 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 can happen. Uh, not everybody will agree necessarily that this is such an emergency. Another way is um, for the legislature to act. Uh, it's November. The legislature will be in session around the middle of January. Um, they could fix this um, pretty quickly, and hopefully the governor would sign it. You know, they don't have to wait till the end of the session. They can do this on day one. The governor can sign it, and so in January we can have. A solution. Uh, I don't think there's anything the city can do. Uh, maybe you could agree or disagree with me about that. I don't think there's anything the city per se can do. I mean, the city council makes a statement that doesn't solve the problem. But maybe the attorney general of the state could do something. Um, the attorney general of the state could opine that that the bill cannot be construed as requiring real members. Um, those four additional members um, on the heart board, because that would be unconstitutional. And he puts his imprimatur on that opinion, um, and that may help. Um, the, only, the only problem is that he's not a court. He's only an attorney general. Um, and his opinion is not, doesn't have the same weight as a Supreme Court, certainly. So I'm yeah. not sure which is the fastest way, Tom, which is the fastest way to get this thing uh, squared away. Uh, I, I think um, you need to convince people that there is a problem uh, and 
the fastest way to do that may be through the court system to get some kind of declaratory relief or an injunction. Um, and then once people are sensitized to it, then there's a possibility uh, that you can get legislative fixes. I mean, when when I uh, and, the, and the foundation uh, challenged the rail skim in 2015, um, the court system took a very long time and our solution did come out of the legislature, for example. So I'm, I'm not uh, entirely, you know, writing off the legislature as a, uh, as, as a possible um, uh, de deliverer of relief because they've done that before. Well, it's the best but one, I isn't it? I, I think so. And, and, but, but they, but they first need to be convinced that, that there's a problem. And, um, I'm worried about that because there were three bills in the last legislature to to deal with this problem and they weren't acted on. Ooh. Well, how, how does the public feel about it? I mean, uh, aside from watching this discussion, I suppose, how does the public feel about it? Um, does the public care? If the public uh, is faced with this issue, if somebody raises this issue publicly, how do you think the public would react? And, you know, therefore, really, I'm asking what the politics are. Um, there are some people who just don't like rail, and they would like to see the whole thing stuck. Um, other people would say... Yeah, I, mean, I think this is, this is a, a very, very technical issue, and uh, it'll take a backseat to a public opinion on rail generally. If they if they don't like it, um, they they will try to find ways to monkey wrench. It. Like I think uh, this is what Senator Favela is doing. You know he's he's throwing a monkey wrench at it, and then the question is whether it's going to hit something, you know, whether it's going to hit something important. How does the Tax Foundation of Hawaii feel about it? Um, we're we're pulling our uh, directors right now. I mean, the way I feel about it uh, is we need to have a solution that preserves both the legislature's ability to appoint, uh, you know, observers, which is which is what they did, uh, and to prevent undue interference with the, uh, you know, the functioning of a legitimately created uh, city instrumentality. Which, which I think was an unintended consequence, but that's, but that's what's happened. And I think the, the state constitution does prevent that kind of thing. I, I think it, it would allow the, um, the, the members to be seated. Uh, and I don't think it'll, it would allow the, uh, the vote requirement to be screwed with like that. And, and I, I'm hoping that, you know, the, uh, uh, the court will come up with that solution and and we uh right now i'm thinking of filing an amicus brief to suggest you know that very same thing yeah that would be a good result if the court did that of course there might be an appeal you know favela might appeal and then you know you'd have uh, additional layers of delay um but but let's assume you could get a court to do that that would be a pretty good thing then go to the legislature also to confirm that and, and, you know, what about an attorney general opinion? I mean, if you went down to uh, Claire Connor right now and said, can you give me an opinion on this? Um, would you get one or would you rely on one? Well, first of all, I don't know how long how long that would take. And, and second of all, uh, I don't know the significance that it'll have. I mean, there are people uh, with million dollar contracts, billion dollar contracts, and they they have to be able to rely on something. I'm sure that's so, Tom. You yeah. you can't spend um, you know these billion dollar contracts um, without having approvals by that board. And so this has got to get in the way of some, maybe many, contracts until it's resolved. Let me ask you this: If you were a contracting party and you had a contract sitting on Hart's uh, desk, so to speak, and Hart was supposed to approve the contract, uh, and Hart could not get those votes, um, would you rely on that? I don't think so. No, I'd be, I'd be very uneasy until I, got my, until I got my eight votes. Yeah, yeah. So the six vote thing uh, from uh, Hoyt Z is not, I don't think that's gonna work, not in the case of a 
pending lawsuit and all. Um, gee, this is a real problem. And, and what does it teach us? You know, we have a couple of minutes left. What does it teach us in terms of good government going forward? No, I, I think there needs to be a balance between, you know, uh, having the, uh, you know, the, the real stakeholders uh, at the table to give input and provide a solution uh, as long as it doesn't gum up the works, which this apparently has. Uh, I, I don't know how many people in the public would care. I don't know how many people at the legislature would care about this uh, apart from caring about rail generally. Okay, uh, it's it's kind of a technical thing, but but I think it's of major importance uh, to especially to the contractors because they need some finality in knowing that uh, you know their contracts are not going to be set, you know set aside later on. So I think it's of critical importance, but uh, but it's very hard to 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 get your head wrapped around it, especially if you don't know a whole lot about what's going on. It's a troubled project. For sure. Got all There's kinds been, of troubles, yeah. All kinds of one thing after another. And, um, you know, it's political, it's, it's uh, sometimes incompetence, uh, it's an, an, a never ending parade um, of uh, individuals who go through that board, who go through the management job in that board. Extraordinary how many problems. Maybe it's not, um, you know, dissimilar from other such projects in the country. But wow, this one has had more than its fair share, I think, including problems with the federal government, in, including problems with federal politics. You know? So if you ask me what we mm, should take away from the whole experience, it's that- What should it, we take it, away from the whole experience, Jay? I'm gonna tell you that. It's funny that you should ask. <laughs> you know, <clears throat> this, this this project is not a happy project. It was never a happy project. Um, at the beginning, it was not a happy project. And uh, Mufi Hanneman crammed it down our throats um, back, uh, what, 10, 15, maybe more, 20 years ago. Um, and uh, you know, we all remember how he did that. But I remember we had a program at, uh, with Think Tech and the Hawaii Venture Capital Association at which Neil Milner spoke. Uh, from the university, you know, uh, uh, political science professor and all that at the time. And um, Neil said this, you know, you have a project like this, you have to get the public to buy in before, you know, you, you do the legal, you know, approvals, um, not after. And in this case, for this project, because it was crammed down this way, um, the public hadn't really approved it. And the, the public hasn't really approved it since, even though it was, you know, technically approved legally. Um, and so I think that in terms of a big project like this in any community, you really have to sell it first. And it was never properly sold. That's why it is not a happy project. Do you agree? I agree that it's not a happy project. <laughs> well, thank you, Tom. Thank you for this. Um, revelation and uh, extraordinary issue that will affect us all whether we like it or not fiscally and in terms of disruption and delay in our community um i hope we can follow this issue going forward i think i think there will be more won't there there sure will thank you tom yamachika tax foundation of hawaii and this is talking tax with tom thank you so much thank you Jay.